The Bach cello suites. You've heard him, you love him, they might even be the reason you got into playing cello, and the first prelude especially is just, it transcends classical music, it's a song of our generation. Welcome to Higher Hertz, my name is Justin Leppard, your online cello teacher, and today we're going to learn how to play the first Bach cello suite prelude. <laughs> So this prelude from the first box suite is an introductory movement to a set of dance movements, six in each suite. And the prelude is distinct by not being in a dance form, old classical dance forms, um, in that it's meant to be an improvisatory intro to the other songs. And this was performance practice at the time. Bach happened to kind of write out what would be a nice improvisation. Of course, it's a little bit nicer than just a nice improvisation, as Bach was one of the greatest improvisers of all time. And the it, it has a character uh, and a feel to it that's kind of dreamlike and meditative. I think this is part of the reason why people gravitate to it so much. Some of the other movements in it, there's one called Jig, which is old timey for Jig, but a lot of the other movements are not dances that you would know, Gavotte, Sarabande, these are kind of old classical dances that don't really exist anymore except for maybe the few people who want to keep those traditions alive. But nonetheless, we're talking about the prelude of the first Bach cello suite. G major, the whole suite's in G major, that's true of all six suites, and it starts with basically the first half is just chords just a series of chords. You could re-notate the entire first half instead of being individual notes to just saying, play these chords every bar, except, or half bar as it were, uh, except for the fact that there's, you know, a particular uh, realization it would be called. The realization of the chord is how you actually play it in Baroque music. And Bach has written this out for us. But other than that, the first, you know, four chords are a like a one, four, five, one progression in G with a G pedal. And a pedal is where one note holds below several chords. So we have G major, G, D, and C. And then we have C major with G at the bottom. So it's actually a second inversion C major chord. If it were sounded normally with C at the bottom, it would sound like that. It sound a little bit like we were in the key of C major if we did that because we would have heard G and then and we would have heard the G as the five. So that's part of the reason for the pedal. And then we do what would be a D major seven chord, except we have the G pedal. And then we play G, but we have resolved the F sharp that's in the third finger to the G that's the fourth finger. And the bowing that we use uh, well, actually, the actual bowing that we use is up for debate. And this is one of the fun things about delving into Bach cello suites is you have to decide how these notes ought to sound. It's not intrinsically clear. And some people will play the opening all separate bow. A very common bowing is to slur the first three and then do separate, so that it's kind of like rolling a chord. And there I was also slurring uh, the two eighth notes in a row, beats three and four of the bar. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can play this, in other words. So that makes playing it not a very straightforward thing. And so that's one of the interesting things about this one in particular. Even though Bach didn't necessarily intend for it to be so, as the suites progress, they get more and more difficult, especially with the sixth suite, which was written for a five-string cello that no longer exists, so playing it today requires lots of thumb position and going up high. So for the very first movement of all of this, it's so relatively simple but it will still take a lifetime to master. And that's why people like Yo-Yo Ma have recorded this several times. There's several recordings out there because there is no definitive version. 
So how do we learn how to play it then if there's no definitive version? Because obviously there can't just all be correct interpretations. And one could say that it's all about playing, oh, well, you have to play in time and in tune. Sure, but you have to play in time and in tune in a way that makes sense because you could play. <laughs> And if you wanted to do that convincingly, you have to find something in that that makes it interesting to listen to. Like, I'm not saying you can't do a very, very straightforward version of this movement. So let's talk about why. So if you were to do that, what would you have to do? You'd have to make sure that every note sounded so completely even within the musical context that it was worth listening to. And what that means is every note would still probably actually be played a little bit differently because in order to perceive that the notes are the same sometimes we have to do something different why am i talking about all of this interpretation stuff right at the beginning instead of just jumping into what the notes are because i don't like frustration i don't like over involvement in a process that you're unprepared for the notes of this piece are pretty simple and barring some shifting which we have talked about in our videos already you can find the sheet music for this almost anywhere and you can sit down and you can slowly practice through the notes. And that's exactly what you should do when you first get started. But you don't need me for that. What you need a teacher for, or in this case, the best facsimile for it, is somebody who's gonna teach you, how do you get over that hump where you have been practicing the notes, but it just doesn't sound right. And that's where interpretation as well as technical facility comes in. So with this piece, it's not very long. Most performances of it are going to be about two, two and a half minutes long. So it's not actually as long as like a pop song even. It's a very, very short song. And it might be worth, for example, working backwards with this. The second half of this movement is very dreamlike. It's a lot of scales and runs and moments that pause at the bottom and then continue on the offbeat, uh, the first half is so different from that. What does the first half do that makes the second half worth listening to? So these are the questions that sort of matter as we're trying to take it from, I've practiced the notes to, I kind of like the way that I'm playing this. So one approach that I think works very well, and we can start getting into some more specifics now, is to think of the first half as a organist improvising. So the way that an organist is going to be thinking, organists compared to cellists are thinking much more harmonically, which is to say they're thinking about the stacks of notes, chords, all of the over, overlapping voices that make up music, right? So cellists, we're typically thinking of only one note at a time. So when we're playing these chords, it's going to be really awkward if we're trying to play it as though we might try to sing it. So what I mean by that is when we sing a melody, our voice wants notes that are close together because it's awkward to sing like this and really hit the notes accurately. So with Bach, it's not going to make sense in this first half to go oh, ha, 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 ha. It sounds incredibly awkward to sing. It's actually not even what the part is. What the part is, is three different voices going on simultaneously. You have a righteous low note that for the first four bars is G. Ba, ba. That's singable, even for me. You also have the second note, which does change. It goes from D to E to F sharp to G. And then you have the top note. So you could imagine a choir of three cellos all playing, holding out these chords. You have and you have and then you have and instead we have to play all of those notes and this is what can make it really challenging is that we're playing three different parts at once but Bach has been clever about it and made it actually feasible to play on our instruments where I can't actually demonstrate for you holding all three of those notes it would crunch doesn't work so what can we do to make it sound like three different voices and to save ourselves the hassle of wondering why our articulations don't sound good and our string crossings are missing and our intonation is questionable well what we can do is we can go through conceptually 
finding the chords. And we can also really dial in the bowings themselves. So we've talked about this in our practice episode, but what we want to do is to really respect how difficult it is to cross strings when we're doing this. We might even just want to start with the first bar really slowly. <laughs> So what I'm doing right now is I'm just trying to find my favorite way of playing G string and noting the angle that my hand went and where the bow touched on the string. And I'm not playing through the piece right now, so I don't have to be too concerned with anything. I'm just working on this one note right now. Now the next note that I'm gonna to wanna to work on is D. And if I'm doing my slurred bowing, then I'm gonna to have to be higher up on the bow, still going down bow. This is how I practice it. I like that. Let's find the A, and then we have to pu start putting these together. Actually, first finger will be down, so we can do that. Okay, so let's just start by working on this first chord. We're gonna connect the G and D. Now, when we're crossing strings like this, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And one thing to think about is that you have a little bit of rotation possibility. The bow can be a slightly different angle and still be on the same string before hitting another string. So what that means is you can be like all the way, you know, down on this side of the G string and then try to cross up onto the higher part of the D string. You have to move much further than if you were just right next to the D string and then you move to be just next to the G string. So this is something worth practicing in slow motion where... See that? Let's do all three strings. The bow's moving really smooth and controlled, and it just fades one note right into the other. Now we're gonna be moving a little bit quicker than this, but we're but that's the basic formula. So let's try to keep the bow really short because it's gonna be faster. Alright, I think we kind of got that. Now, the second part of this is going to be, which can introduce some problems because we're lifting up our finger, we're playing an open string, we're playing the open A string, which is the most offensive sounding open A string, at least it can, it can definitely be. So we're going to do the same thing. Okay, now the second note is going to be an up bow. And it's hard to get it sounding as warm, right? So with this note, we're gonna want to maybe even de-emphasize it a little bit. If, if it's, it's not even one of the beats. So if we have, that's gonna sound amateurish. So what we can work on is maybe even a slightly bigger, maybe a little bit of vibrato even, and then just a nice lighter, that second one wasn't as nice, just a nice lighter A string. And then here we have a slur again, so to play those notes a little bit faster. Let's try putting all of this together. I've broken this down a lot, and all we're in is the first bar. But I want you guys to realize that that is what practicing is. Spend a day just practicing the first bar. As Yo-Yo Ma will famously tell you, the way that he learned this piece was two bars at a time, practicing every day for an hour. And he got the whole thing in like three weeks. And that's a bit of an unusual way to start learning, but man, he jumped right in with the music and he was focused on the details. It's okay to practice just one bar. Make sure not to neglect a bar at the end because you spent so much time practicing the first bar, but we're gonna get to that. <laughs> And already, we're playing a lot more lushly, a lot more beautifully. Now, once we start to get to that point where we know the notes and we've kind of broken them down and we've practiced our shifts, the thing we want to really think about is phrasing. And if we're thinking about phrasing right from the beginning, it's going to help a lot, but it's going to be hard to think about that from the beginning if you're not used to it. But when you play the notes, remember, these are three voices. So how would the middle voice, the ones that are on the, the notes that are on the D string, how would they rise subtly in volume or intensity and then fall? 
versus the A string. So usually the middle voice is going to be kind of the glue that holds it together. So when we're playing this, we want to think about the story that the G string alone can tell. We'll start with that, you know. Maybe play that one a little separately. So we could play bar three G string, the loudest of all, and then bars two and four a little bit quieter. And that's already telling a story through those first few bars without even the other notes, without even the actual harmonic movement. With the A string, we're going to want to start pretty strong and just subtly get a little bit louder. But with the middle notes, we can start even quieter and then rise to meet so that the bar gets more intensity as it goes on. All of this is really subtle, but let's hear what it sounds like to be doing that. So we're going to be telling the story with the G string, smoothly coming in with the D string and starting strong with the A string and just incrementally going up and down. There's a lot of different ways you could do, you could approach continuing on. Um, for the purposes of time in this video, I just want to briefly say continue this process and continue trying to think about what the chords are. Just first identify those notes of the chord that you're playing, really work on how you want them to sound and build up. Realize that this piece is deceptively simple because you're playing three parts at once. And you have to know how all those parts relate with each other to start finding that performance that sounds easy and sounds relaxed and sounds balanced. Now, when you get to the second page, there's, there's this huge stop right before the second half of this. And with that, we end the three voice thing being at least as obvious as it is, and we begin a scalar thing. With these notes, you want to picture what gravity looks like. When you get to the high point, you hold for a second and you calm down. When you go low, you can go a little faster coming back up. This is how I think of it. Then you get to this moment where um, you, the typical performance practice, even though it's just printed straight eighth notes, is to land towards the downbeat. So you get downbeat, pause, downbeat, pause. Then the final section of the piece happens, the infamous hocketing. Now, when you're playing this section, the bowing that I like the most is to start by going up, down, and then I'm going to teach you a secret moment where you'll switch to going down up. So for this, start by just practicing the notes that aren't the repeating A string. So. Easier if I have the music in front of me, but then what you're gonna do is practice just the hocket. Going back and forth between those bows, those strings smoothly. You wanna kind of almost make a circle with your wrist, but it'll kind of, it's kind of somewhere in between a circle and coming up and down. And just hold that arm out there and let it be what it is. Final thing is, is that every note on the D string is going to be different, but the A string is always going to be the same. So you're going to have to slowly practice still the transition. So. That way, when you speed it up, you're still hearing that nice melody, so to speak, in the D string. And there's 
the secret moment because we switch from the A string being the pedal to the D string being the pedal. The reason being we're in the key of G. A is the second chord, D is five, two, five, one is kind of the most basic chord progression. So we have the A pedal, then, so once we switch to the D pedal, slur that. And then we'll do down, up, down, up, down, up. And I don't think I have to tell you again at this point to do the same work. Go slowly to get each note to sound right against the hocket. And then we finally have these chords. And if you're having some hard, uh, having a hard time with the final chord, one thing some people do is down bow on the low strings, up bow on the high strings. Or some variation of that. So you can split it up because you're already splitting up the chord. All right, guys, this is an incredibly awesome piece, an incredibly deceptively simple piece that is amazing part of the repertoire. And, and this video barely scratches the surface of what there is to cover with this piece, but it's already so long that I'm going to have to leave it there. And please try to reach out with any questions if you want more help learning this piece. Link to the music below. Once again, my name is Justin Leopard, and this has been a production with Higher Hertz. So stay subscribed for more lesson videos because we've got them coming and we want you guys to learn and we want you to have a great time with cello. To see more of my performances, I'm on YouTube as the Vagabond Cellist. But for now, that's all. We guys, thank you guys for watching and we'll see you in the next episode.